So uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about user experience. We're going in a slightly different direction here. My design studio, Big Medium, works on creating user experiences for digital products. So that often means refining product concept, but then you know, creating the interface, the interactions, all the stuff that human beings see of our digital products. Uh, for the last decade, that's really been pretty much a focus on mobile. So a lot of responsive websites, apps for companies like eBay. I led the design of uh, websites like TechCrunch, Entertainment Weekly, Time Inc., O'Reilly Media. Uh, but the stuff that's really exciting that's happening now that I think we're all here for is exactly like the kind of things we were hearing about with iDevices, is how the mobile interfaces are starting to leap off the screen and start to talk to uh, uh, the physical world, right, where the world itself is becoming the interface to these digital systems. So we've got all these new sensor-based inputs where it's not even just the phone running the physical interface and, and where the phone screen is the interface, but stuff like speech, natural gesture, uh, camera vision, passive sensor tracking, uh, uh, predictive interfaces through things like big data. I think, though, that the combinations of these things are actually interesting, which could be a little bit abstract. So I wanted to show you a demo of what it looks like when you combine speech and natural gesture as an interface. Expelliarmus! Oh yeah! Expecto Patronum! Yeah! Expecto Patronum, folks. You wave your hand, say a word, and something magic happens over there, right? And this is really what we're starting to be able to get to uh, the magic uh, uh, you know, appears to be part of the world. Of course, it's, it's really the magic here is unseen servers and processors interpreting our will and doing our bidding. Uh, but if you're paying close attention, you might have noticed that stick that they were waving around. And friends, I did a little bit of looking around, and it turns out they call this thing a magic wand, right? Which is a, a tool to project content and media at a distance, right? So it's really intent translated to action, which is, from my job as an interaction designer, what it's all about, right? How do I collapse the time and effort that it takes to think of an action and for it to actually result? Uh, but here, right, the technology is invisible. This is it. The magic seems to live within the user, really, and that's the kind of magic that I want to talk about today. It's a shift in perspective that I've found really useful over the last year or two in my product design and interaction design. So let me start with what I think is probably a familiar quote uh, from Arthur C. Clarke, and I think this is really true, right? When the technology becomes invisible, it no, it, it, it's no longer a machine doing something for us. It seems to be nature itself doing our bidding. Uh, but that's not typically the way that we design products. And I think that's somewhat natural as technologists for us to focus on the technology. But I want to challenge the way that we think about products from the outset and sort of try to put technology aside a little bit. So I want to talk uh, at first, of course, about Google Glass. Uh, so Google Glass, alas, of course, defunct. and never really got out of the prototype stage. So I don't want to beat up on it too much. But I think there are several reasons that it, it, caught, it, it never caught on. Uh, just to focus on one of them, from the outside at least, Google Glass always looked like an engineering project, right? So it's sort of like, well, let's see, I got, I got these cameras and memory and processors and this tiny little screen. What if I put it on your face, right? It's almost sort of this hostile imposition of technology. So their starting question was, we have this tech, what can I do with it? You know, whereas I think it may be a more interesting question would have been, what if this thing was magic? What if these glasses were magic? What is it about glasses and their context that can be powerful? And, and here I'm like literally talking about thinking in terms of magic, of going back to the tropes of, of myth and magic, literally thousands of years of stories that we've been telling each other about what happens if objects in the world were magic, in this case, sprinkled with some digital pixie dust. Right? And it, we have these design patterns. We know how things like mirrors or magic spy glasses or magic amulets are supposed to work. And that's really what we're creating now when we're creating 
connected devices, right, is, is physical objects that have some new kind of superpower. So I think thinking about ma magic vision, you know, Google might have started there. And just a little thought experiment to take you through what I'm talking about is let's do our own little experiment with another everyday object, a coffee cup. So if we were going to wire this up for digital interaction, and if we first asked, you know, what if this was magic? It, it's a little bit goes beyond you know, what it is specifically that this does, which is lift hot liquid to my face without me burning it if all goes well. But really starting to think about what is this cup witness to? What actions is it adjacent to? How does it fit into my life? And you start to think about what this coffee cup is. It's, it's the thing that's with me as I gain consciousness and I become myself every day. Or it's the thing that's with me late at night when I'm working on a deadline. Or it's what's between you and me when we're catching up about what's been going on in our life. Or there might be many of them in a meeting at work as we're trying to figure these things, figure out what to do next. Right? So it's, it's all these, these physical contexts, which also in turn have a certain emotional context. Right? And if you start to think of like, well, what, what if you drop this cup into that context and you made it magic, what might it do in those cases? So we can ask questions like, you know, what if it can listen? or remember, or make loud, unpleasant noises? What if it can speak? Or does it have brothers and sisters? Uh, uh, is it noisy and annoying, or is it quiet and soothing? You start to have like all these different things that start from a very different place than leading with the technology. If, what happens if I put these sensors here? It starts from a very human place. It meets a human need in a human context. And you start to get to very different product ideas. Uh, I'm working with uh, a well-known fashion designer on creating uh, a, a connected jacket. Uh, this is a photo from one of our working sessions, and we wanted to go beyond some of the obvious stuff of, of the kind of sensors and, and uses that you put on this, of like an activity tracker, or a location check-in, or Google's new Project Chicard thing with Levi's, where it's like, oh, I can use my jacket to control my phone. Okay. But it's like, what does it actually mean to essentially create a magic jacket. And it goes again to thinking about these contexts. We have a research framework that takes a really close look at all the ways that an object, or a wearable in this case, touches the people and places around it. And we consider how might we make that object, in this case this jacket, more of that thing, more of what it already is. And you think about it, so jackets are about transition. You know, you, you wear it to go from one place to another, from inside to outside, to join another group of people. It's also the armor that you wear against the outside world, sometimes very literally. Or it's also an invitation to others, a signal of your tribe. So we've, we've rapidly identified a number of ways that technology could really quietly support those roles, rather than impose technology upon them. Uh, and I think that the questions that we asked in that context led this product design to a whole new place. You'll find out in about a year what we come up with, but I think that it's just I want to focus on that ideation of that perspective that leads to a more sort of humane thing. In other words, what I'm talking about is that you're designing for the thing's essential thingness. You're making it a coffee cup or a jacket, but more so. So it's designing from the inside out. Friends, not everything needs to be disrupted. Now, sometimes things can just be amplified. And I think it's uh, something that's relevant to what we were just thinking about with, you know, what is a smart home? Why do I want a smart home? Is that even a goal? Because I don't think I really want home automation as a goal, unless I'm sort of a hobbyist and a tinkerer. What I really want is my home to be more of what it already is, as a sanctuary, as a place to connect with friends and family. And if connecting objects in my home or making them more aware of their context or of one another can help that, then that's great. But I think the idea is, in other words, how can we bend technology to our lives and not the reverse, to make things more like they are, to make us more human? Because I think that's the crux of magic, right? In Harry Potter, Hermione's beaded bag, is magic, because it's bigger on the inside, it can hold an impossible quantity. Its magic makes it more of a bag, enhancing its essential role. You know, so what is the role? What is the physical, cultural, emotional context of the object that you're trying to connect? I think that that leads to, again, really interesting product possibilities.
So some examples. Neiman Marcus installed this mirror at some stores. They call it the memory mirror because it holds on to your image. So after you do a little spin, whoops, after you do a little spin, uh, you can see your outfit in 360 degrees. So it's sort of dressing room instant replay, which also means that you can compare your current outfit to one that you tried on a minute ago. Or even uh, better, the mirror can show you your dress in a variety of different colors. And you can take those mirror memories and share them with friends to ask their advice. Because, uh, you know, the mirror sort of takes care of it. Turns out, uh, you know, obviously this very sort of common use case is, is uh, sort of taking pictures of yourself in the mirror and sort of sending it. It's like, should I get it? Should I get it? How do I look? Right. And this actually takes that. It's like, well, why, don't, why doesn't the mirror take care of that? So again, sort of thinking about the context and activity in place uh, and saying, you know, what if the mirror was, was magic here? And again, I don't know if you guys know this, but this technology was previously available only to evil stepmother queens. Right? And now it's available to everyone. So my suggestion here is that we should raid the evil queen's castle for ideas, that we have a centuries-long fascination with magic objects. What if we could bring these things to, to life to make us smarter or stronger or live longer? Again, we have all these design patterns already, these stories of how we know how magic mirrors are supposed to work. Let's, let's use them. So what if objects could speak to us or share what they've seen and what they know? We've got the sorting hat from Harry Potter. Hmm, difficult, very difficult. Oh, I lost my audio. Plenty of courage, I see. Not a bad mind, either. So this is this mind-reading wearable that knows you better than you know yourself, that can make decisions you don't know how to make. So it's Google Now and hat form, right? Or household tools that are just smart enough to help us do all the dumb stuff that we've got to do. It's like a Roomba for the medieval era, right? And what about if we sort of go a little bit further in time? We've got Dorothy in The Wizard of Oz. We've got her magic shoes, her ruby slippers, give her the power to escape. It was a really powerful trope throughout magic. In fact, we use our, our phones, too. You might have been, during the networking part, being like, I'm a really, really, little nervous. I'm going to use my phone and look like I'm really busy. Kind of escape, right? All right, so what if we do this? What, is, what, how, what if we update uh, her ruby slippers? The Dorothy Project imagines the same thing, of using your shoes as a magic escape Staying method. on a first date, select receive a call, create a fake contact, and slip the ruby in your shoe. Now, when things get unbearable, click your heels together three times and answer that pressing phone call from your boss. Oh, sorry, my boss is calling. I've got to take this. Oh, I'll, I'll see you on Tinder. I love you. Not to love. Uh, so, I think a lot of this, if you sort of go back to some of the, the sort of really fundamentals of interface design from 30 years ago, Alan Kay, who basically invented the graphical user interface, said this in 1982, that fantasy, kind of the illusion or metaphor of something being much easier to understand than it actually is, helps us understand this really complex churn of, of ones and zeros that are happening under the hood of our, of our digital system. Of course, we do this with our HVAC systems, our cars. We have this illusion that it's as simple as turning a wheel and pumping a couple of pedals. Incredibly complex device there. So we've got this, this fantasy, all user interface, it's a kind of fantasy or illusion. And I think way back then, he was saying, well, let's embrace that. Or another way to put it, as he said over 30 years ago, is that the computer disappears into the environment. I think this is a big part of this. How can we uh, not literally make it invisible, but make it effortless, in the same way that using a pencil is effortless? I don't mean necessarily pushing everything off to the algorithm, but how do we make it so that the technology kind of gets out of the way so that we can do what we're trying to do? Again, without really fundamentally altering our behavior in many cases. I worked on the user experience uh, for this product, uh, Propeller Health. At the time, it was called Asmapolis, but they changed the name because Asmapolis. Uh, but it's, a, it's basically a system to help people understand how well their asthma is controlled. So it's just this little Bluetooth sensor that goes on the top of your asthma inhaler. And every time you have an attack, you take a puff, and it essentially registers the date and time with your phone, and then you get these uh, daily and weekly updates about how well your asthma is controlled, because often, as in so many cases, we don't actually 
We are actually very honest with ourselves about how well we're doing and gives you some specific advice about how to address it. So that's useful on the individual level. But what's really interesting is that they uh, put these things out at the, uh, uh, through clinics. So you have a couple of thousand of these in, um, in a community. And so they're able to get this epidemiological information. Oh, an hour after people go through this part of town, we see an uptick of attacks. So actually being able to understand the causes of asthma in the community. I think this is really interesting because it's not just serving the individual. It's not just sort of a gadget for the wealthy. It's not just a fitness tracker. It's something that says, how can we actually change the understanding of our community to improve our social health? I think that that's the kind of thing that we have the opportunity to think of as we start to really gather this uh, highly personal information. I'm just going to show you one more uh, example of just thinking about how to uh, use this stuff in a really sort of magical, interesting way. Just everyday technologies. And then I'll, uh, I'll wrap this up. This is my friend Aral Balkan. He looks a little bit tired here because he's at the other end of a 24-hour hackathon. You guys know what I'm talking about. You go, you bring some code, maybe some devices, work overnight, and if all goes well, you have something to show for it. Uh, I want to point out these wine bottles here at the back. He's actually on a yacht off the French Riviera at a hackathon called The Boat That Hacks. So if you're going to go to a hackathon, he obviously knows what he's doing. It's the hack for the 1%, I guess. But to this hack, he brought uh, a projector, connect, phone, and laptop. And this is the hack that he put together. So you're sitting at home on your sofa watching television as something interesting comes on and you want to share it, say tweet it. So um, I walk up to my TV and I just kind of wave at it so it knows I'm there. Um, and then when something interesting comes up, I can just grab it and boom, put it over there. I grab and boom, I put it over there. So I'm just holding it in my hand and I'm putting it on my phone. And that's my hack. I want to be clear, he did this overnight drinking wine on a boat. Right, so while that's sort of surprising and exciting, it's actually like he, he did these things that are fundamental to these two interactions, which is that just, you know, teach the connect this gesture, take a screenshot, and then, you know, you can hold it in your hand, like you've got it right here, right? But by, by now, it's probably already on the phone, touch to release. This is two simplest possible gestures for each of these uh, systems, but the combination of them yields something that is both easy and surprising and delightful. And so my point is this is just everyday technology. This is stuff that you might already have in your handbag, or your pocket, in your living room, in the case of a Kinect. And so part of this is, of course, a challenge of technology, but this isn't all it. We're awash in technology. A lot of this is really, frankly, a challenge of imagination. How do we put this stuff together in new and interesting and, frankly, more humane ways? Because this is an exciting time to be inventing stuff, truly magical interfaces. And so I just want to encourage you to go out and make something amazing. Thanks so much, you guys. Ta-da! Thank you. Thank you very much. So, so practically, oops, that, that means that uh, would you recommend that any startup would have a designer at the very beginning as co-founder to build that you know, UX and UI sort of natively and that search for magic so that the product doesn't become immediately just a technology product? I think in a, yes. So it's not just a technology thing, but it's also more than a designer. It's somebody who can do some research and spend some time out in the world understanding what is the context for this object. How do we build upon those existing behaviors? A lot of times we guess and we make assumptions, but we impose our own worldview. And frankly, as technologists, often a more technological worldview onto things. And it costs us money. I mean, it's, it is so cheap to go out and do a little bit of solid research. And it saves so much time and effort and gives you so many surprising uh, uh, insights to actually build something that people will want and will frankly use because it folds into their lives rather than imposed upon them. Great, wonderful. Do we have a question we have time for? Maybe one. I liked your uh, quick riff at Google Glass for design and, and saying like, well, it was kind of putting a computer on your face and I totally understand that. I couldn't imagine wearing it around in my daily life uh, for user purpose. But do you, do you think that the, the standard for UX is different for business applications? So 
Uh, so, yeah, for if it, for design or engineering or something like that. Yeah, great question. I mean, you know, there are many people who wear, frankly, ridiculous things uh, for safety, ridiculous looking, and things that we would never wear for for fashion or every day. And you know, we leave those at home in the locker. So yeah, I think that there's definitely a case where, in the same way that a surgeon will use some sort of special scope uh, during surgery, you know, it's like, sure, let's use this stuff in in the workplace. And it, you know, and it, it's all sort of so much of this is just socially, social context, right? How do we build upon existing social context and social norms? Technology can certainly change those social norms. The way that the way that we understand it being okay to use a phone has changed over the course of just a really very few years because of the benefits of it. Uh, but I think that if you sort of start by saying, let's sort of not turn us, you know, I think that the, the market of people who want to look like a cyborg is extremely small. Uh, so let's sort of think about what's, what is the, how do we go into the mainstream of, of social stuff? Because right now I think what we're battling with things like the Internet of Things is because it's so technology forward, it favors technologists and tinkerers, uh, which is for, it's not an insignificant audience, but it's also, you know, it's the stuff that when we get to this thing where it, it just works and it fits into my life, we already bend ourselves and contort ourselves into so many ways uh, for, to fit the technology that I think that there's a real fatigue around that. So how can we do the reverse? Thanks. Great. Well, one last quick question because I want to keep things moving over there. So, oh, sure. how do you how do you approach when it doesn't work like it does? Right. I mean. Yeah, just wanting to grab, but it must be frustrating to just be grabbing at nothing and nothing's happening. I mean, this happens to us all the time, right? Where it's like, I mean, I don't know, who's got an echo at home? And it's just like, when Alexa gets it wrong, and the whole system is designed to understand speech, and it just won't get it. So frustrating, right? So I think a couple of things to think about there is certainly to design to anticipate failure. Uh, and part of that is, I think that with a, a surprising number of things, if the... Uh, digital aspect of it, the magical aspect of it goes wrong, the thing is completely broken. I think that one of the things that we have to do is make sure that the mechanical aspect of these devices continues to work. So there's sort of a progressive enhancement idea of this, where it's like, well, I've got this analog device that will work no matter what, and then the magic happens sometimes. So I've got to fall back to sort of do this stuff in the cases where I haven't figured it out or the device isn't understanding me. So in the same way that an escalator uh, is still stairs when it doesn't work, that's what we want to go to. Elevators, on the other hand, tend to be coffins. So it's, it's sort of thinking, it's like, let's make more escalators. All right, wonderful. Thank you so Thanks, much, everybody.